Uh, I jumped the gun. I, I called the last one nihilistic cringe. I was too presumptuous. I acted too quickly. Cause this is nihilistic cringe. In his official summary for the book, Anisian claims that James in the first book was, uh, was the light. But Arthur Gale here is the darkness. You should all have edgelord alarms going off in your head right now. This is the, I didn't, mm, oh, it's so bad. This one is, this is significantly worse than his first book. I thought there would be some degree of improvement. Maybe he would improve on his, his formatting or his prose a little bit, maybe his character. Um, there's like a mild improvement in the character's consistency, but I don't think that was really intentional. I'll get into that in a bit. It is so bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you like the rainbow forest, the tabs we got here? This is so bad that... Hold on. <clears throat> so, I've been using these to mark things. You'll notice I don't have any yellow on this. That is because there are so many typos in this book that I ran out. I didn't really go into detail in the typos in the last book. I'll be going to some typos here. They're largely the same thing. They're mostly grammatical errors. Interestingly enough, he doesn't think you need to capitalize letters after sentences uh, in this one. Not all the time. It's a, it's a, a rare problem, but it does happen. But I do want to do a quick comparison so you guys see what I'm dealing with. This is Stones to Abigail. This is what this book looks like with all the tabs. And bonus treat, I still have my copy of New Moon. Don't worry though, I only paid 10 cents for it. However, you'll notice not that many tabs in comparison. It's still something of a forest, but not nearly as bad. But Onision's second book, This Is Why I Hate You. I can't see the pages anymore. There are so many tabs that looking at the side, I can't see individual pages. This is insane. Just to go over the tabs again for anyone who might not remember. Uh, blue tabs are for bad character moments. Green tabs are for bad world and story building. Orange are for pure cringe. Pink are for bad lines. And yellow is for pretty much everything else that I can't categorize otherwise, which usually comes down to bad writing mistakes in general. Now I wanna play a quick game. I want you guys to actually take a moment to guess how many typos are in this book. You, you might think 20, you might think 30. These could be bad grammatical errors, uh, misspelled words, misused words, things like that. I'll give you a starting point. Stones to Abigail had a total of 56 typos. This one, has 108. And I'm not going out of my way to find typos, mind you. Those are just the ones I noticed. There are probably more in here. Onision claims he doesn't need uh, any any editors or any help writing his books. Yeah, you do, buddy. This is an atrocity. We will, <laughs> some of these typos are a lot of fun. We will get into them. Oh, I forgot a tab. Just gonna get an orange and there we go. It's actually over his eye like a little visor. That's kind of cool. So, like I said before, Arthur Gale, the main character here, he's a, he's a rugged badass. You don't want to mess with him or his mighty trench coat because he'll beat you up so bad. He's the toughest kid in school. Well, this underappreciated badass decided that he's sick of life in his hometown and he's, he's tired of everyone in school. Also, he gets expelled at one point, so he joins the military and he becomes such an intolerable douche. I actually have a number of friends who served in the military. They would shit on this guy so hard. And I probably need to make this clear early on. I am not going to be making fun of Onision's actual real life military career. As far as I see, anyone who signs up to join the armed forces in the United States Instant badass. You are taking an oath to protect your countrymen, and that's awesome. I don't respect Onision, obviously. He, he doesn't deserve that. So he's signing up to serve in the Air Force for a couple of years, which I believe he did. Um, that's cool. That's, that's a real stand-up kind of thing to do. It's too bad he is an asshole. It does not make you a good person. Especially if some of the stories in this are true because, oh my God, is Arthur Gale such an incredible asshole. 
Like, I didn't like James. I hate Arthur. For two main reasons, but we'll get into that as we review the book. <sighs> Alright, so let's do this. So I actually had a little bit of hope for this one because Onision starts off by explaining that he's going to format the book differently. This is going to be half journal, half recollected stories. And I actually, for a moment, had some small inkling of hope. You see, Greg's writing style in the first book was very ragged, very unpolished. It was ugly. It was absolutely hideous. However, deciding to write a book like it was more like a personalized journal entry would actually do a lot more to fit his style, in large part because he'd be able to get away with not really using dialogue that much, and that was one of his major problems in formatting. Keep in mind, we still have these big blocks of texts, but I'm willing to be a little lenient. It, that could have worked out. Unfortunately, he, he completely screws up on the entire idea. Not only does he go back into using dialogue poorly, but he completely falls apart with the proposed style he's gonna play with. It's a weird combination of journal entries and recollections because he will go from talking to himself like he's doing some sort of a personal log to just telling the story, no jump cut, no scene transition, nothing like that. It's just not even a seamless transition. It's just uh, slams right into a wall and all of a sudden he's talking about something completely different. He'll go on these very lengthy rants, but outside of that, he will treat different paragraphs like they're entirely different chapters. He will just go from talking about how badass he is to talking about how much he hates his father. There is no smooth transitions. The, the, the pacing is incredibly choppy. Now, there's something called a stream of consciousness writing style, which I'm not a fan of, but it is professionally accepted. It's a literary style in which a character's thoughts and opinions have this continuous flow to them. Kind of like a broken faucet spigot. The problem with that style is it can come off as very crude and very choppy, I think. Uh, just look at uh, James Joyce, for example. He wrote in Stream of Consciousness and I hate his books. The style just does not tell a well-flowing narrative. But outside of that, I was almost actually impressed by the setup of the character. Arthur is this angry, gothic kid He's really, he's the loner with a trench coat who idolizes the trench coat mafia. But in terms of meta narrative, it actually had a real chance to work. Mostly because of the about the author section at the very back, which I managed to scope out as I was trying to find out how many pages this was going to be. And this is actually kind of clever. All that the about the author section says is it doesn't matter. And for this kind of cringy pseudo intellectual gothic kid that this was going to be about, that actually, for, for a journal entry specifically, that actually does have a consistent character to it. And I thought that maybe, maybe it could have worked out. It doesn't. Mostly because Arthur Gale, or Arthur Lindfeld as he is really known as, is one of the most detestable characters I have ever read about. A lot of people brought up Holden Caulfield as kind of this entitled brat that James was supposed to be idolizing. It feels like Onision heard about who that was and thought that he could get away with doing the same thing. Anyway, the book does not start off well in the introductory chapter because he starts talking to the audience and tries to explain in this extremely cynical, nihilistic worldview that life is meaningless and that his life has no purpose. But at the same time, he's recording the significant events in his life, so, like, what's the point? I would almost call it a satirical take on nihilism, but I don't think Anision is that clever. Frankly, I'm just getting mixed signals. It also really doesn't work as a journal when Arthur talks directly to the audience. You, reading this now, admit your life is meaningless and admit you don't matter. Um, fuck you. This goes back to a lot of the narcissism that people were accusing Onision of in the comments section of my last video, because he's a combination of total badass and downtrodden pariah. Arthur really comes off as a pretentious douchebag who tries to prove he's smarter than everyone else and he's like some expert on Nietzsche just because he watches Bojack Horseman. No hate on Bojack Horseman though, I love that show. You know what, no, I'm actually gonna take a, a moment to say the opposite. Um, anyone watching this, to some extent, does matter. 
I had to put on a report a couple of months ago for my day job. And one of the things I wanted to do was make it a really nice looking report. I had to go out and get these professional looking binders. So I went down to uh, Staples, but I had no idea where to look. I never shopped in that store. So I asked one of the clerks to help me out. He pointed me to not only the right section, but to exactly the right product that I described to him. He saved me who knows how much bumbling around in the store that I was not familiar with in order to make my presentation better. And it was a little thing. It's, it's not a significant life-changing event, but it doesn't have to be. Small things like that can make someone's entire day that much better. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. All right. Oh, and uh, one thing I forgot to mention, he didn't number any of these pages, so I had to go in and write these myself. There are 130, no, 153 pages, and the whole thing's a disaster. Sorry if this is a little bumpy. So Arthur really just starts off as this angry emo contrarian who just says and likes the opposite of everything his father does just because he doesn't like his father. Oh, and he's back to calling people humans again. Humans are horribly sensitive creatures, as the protagonist of this book will demonstrate. He also goes into this little spiel about how talking is bad. I'm not even kidding. Without verbal language, how do you start a racist, sexist, or homophobic group? How do you organize a war? How do you cause wide-scale suffering if you don't have language like we have? Verbal communication is key to committing genocide. You want world peace? Stop participating in this pointless social game. Commit yourself to silence. Statistically, you likely have nothing valuable to say anyway. Well, yeah, but look at the good side. Verbal communication allows us to deconstruct and make fun of your terrible book. So Arthur just immediately goes into this incredibly antisocial, unlikable, wannabe tough guy. So there's this guy, Chris, who is introduced just so Arthur can complain about him. I imagine if I wrapped my hands around his throat using only half my strength, I could very easily snap his neck. Watch out! We've got a badass over here! Uh, he does the same thing against a woman named Jessica. One thing he loves shitting on is religion, especially if it involves his father. Sure, Dad. Tell me more about how your love for a made-up super god has brought you so much happiness. Every time you do, I just think of all the atheist millionaires who accomplish more for them than your magical invisible deity will ever for you. That is not even a complete thought. Who's them? And he just keeps pounding this into your head over and over. Everyone is, is an asshole. I wouldn't even mind it that much if he knew how to write a sentence. Dad, Jerry, whatever, you're a moron. On a daily basis, you preach about your religion. You're better than me for following it. What? Oh, and of course he goes after uh, fat people. When fat people give me advice on my diet, what am I supposed to do with that? You eat nothing but carbs and are obsessed with pastries. You think it's okay to have copious amounts of dessert at every meal just because you jog a little? You're twice my age, but have the dietary logic of a preteen. They are in high school. They're not far off from preteens. Besides, Arthur, I don't think you have room to judge when you have the emotional maturity of a spoiled six-year-old. The entire first chapter is just Arthur laying out all these people he hates and, and shitting on them. In fact, it, it happens so often, I have a list here on my computer. Here is a brief overview of the people that Arthur hates or rants about. His father, Chris, Jessica, fat people, religious people, his dad's girlfriend, Christians, sports fans, John, his father, fat people again, jocks, people who are religious, vegetarians, fat people, vegans, his father, country music, those of you who believe in a god, drill instructors, his father, military trainers, military instructors, military people, the military in general, a prick named Austin, a punk named Asher, his father, did I mention religion? Sounds like an all-around pleasant guy, doesn't it? Doesn't, doesn't that just make you want to read more about him and his adventures? How damaged are you? That is a very good question, Arthur. Not to mention the utter hypocrisy that Arthur exudes. I won't complain. I won't self-pity. The entirety of the first chapter was nothing about complaining about other people. And as far as self-pitying, he actually violates that on the very next page. Jerry's already talking about her, his girlfriend, moving in soon, which means I will become even more forgotten in this household than I already am. I feel like I should be wearing like five pounds of makeup and mascara while I'm reading this. I don't, I, I should look something like this. Oh, you just don't get it, man. The world is dark and 
deep and edgy. Ugh. Okay, so I wasn't sure if I wanted to mention this now or later, but I think it's important to mention it now because this is the moment in the book where I stopped disliking Arthur and I started hating Arthur. His father apparently likes sports and Arthur decides to say the following. Speaking of sports, I fantasized about a massive weapon going off in the middle of a major sporting event. First off, it's terrible writing for you to call what you clearly mean to be an explosion a weapon. That just sounds awful, but that is nothing in comparison to, did you just okay a terrorist attack? This is, um, this is the part where I'm not having fun. Um, I, I enjoy ripping on books like this because it's amusing, but this is so insensitive and so heartless that it takes me out of the moment. And all Onision is trying to accomplish by writing something like this is to get an emotional reaction. Okay. I've had an emotional reaction. I hate this book. This is an awful book. Whether or not you mean that as some sort of a joke or an edgy moment, or you think it's okay because you're expressing the darkness inside you, this is heartless. This is some of the most awful, cynical writing I have ever put up with. And the only reason I kept going was so that other people wouldn't have to read this. Sure, it would be so incredibly sad. The horror, I know. Meanwhile, from a logical standpoint, the world wouldn't really suffer much losing a condensed population of wasted and aimless lives, AKA the millions of sports fans investing the planet. Fuck you, Greg. <sighs> And apparently Onision knew that that was going to be some sort of an, an edgy, uncomfortable topic because he tries to justify his dislike of sports, not just because it's associated with his father, but the mere lack in intelligence or creativity is why so many generic and useless minds gravitate towards it. Now, I can't speak for all sports. I'm not much of a sports fan myself, but football does take a lot of strategy. I'm talking American football, of course. There is some degree of strategy in all sports, of, of varying degrees. To say that it takes no intelligence or no creativity means you blatantly don't understand the subject, and therefore your opinion is, when you're going to go that extreme, is immediately invalidated. You just sound like this angry, whining contrarian who is just being bitter because you feel good being bitter. Everyone else thinks you're an asshole. Arthur tries to explain that he's not really a sociopath, he just has angry thoughts. He's not actually violent, a thing which he will violate within a few chapters. Of course, it really doesn't help that every single thing that Arthur types, I can hear, how could this happen to me, playing in the background. I struggle with my will to live as is. Spilling blood on my hands would only give me another reason to duct tape a plastic bag around my head and walk off the ledge of a building. Step back from that edge, my Arthur, and by extension Onision, doesn't have an ounce of self-awareness about him. This has been non-stop whining. I'm on page 14. Nothing but complaining. And he has the most pseudo-intellectual thoughts. There's even a part where he tries to explain that free will is not a real thing because he didn't choose to be straight. If I had free will, I could choose to be gay. I could choose to be happy when I looked into the mirror. I could choose to enjoy life to its fullest, but I can't. This is like some sort of psychoanalytical bullshit that just went wrong. Like some kid sat in a psychology class for a month and thought he understood everything about the human condition. I'm getting real tired of your first year psych student bullshit. This kind of thought has the psychological depth of a damp floor. Anyway, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because there's nothing but complaining. The only thing that really happens is Arthur gets attracted to a girl named Ashley. And almost immediately, Ashley gets sexually assaulted. Because I guess as far as Onision's writing is concerned, that's all women are for. You have not seen the last of this, by the way. Oh my god. Um, this may be one of the most impressively awful pages I have ever looked upon. I, I like to highlight sections when I put tabs on them. This is the beginning of the next chapter. This is how bad this is. 
basically this is Arthur reacting to th this guy John who apparently assaulted his girlfriend Ashley. I said, John, are you ready to hurt? That is the least intimidating start to a fight I have ever heard. John no doubt felt somewhat uncomfortable seeing these words come from the lips of someone who looked like me. I would be too. You look weird. I intentionally wore a trench coat and all black that day. Stop idolizing the Columbine shooters. This was a strategy I learned from butterflies, creatures whose literal core design exists to scare... <laughs> Jesus. This is so bad! Mm. Oh, the cringe. I just want you guys to understand how difficult it is to me just to go over some of these lines, because these are so bad. But if I were to go over all of them, we would be here all day. This would be a six hour video. I'm already pushing it enough as much as I, I'm on page 19, mind you. Anyway, so Arthur starts off the fight by punching this John guy in the throat. Uh, he threatens to murder John's friend. John, hits back at him for a little bit, but that's that's only a ruse, because Arthur let it happen. See, this is all part of his plan to make it look like self-defense, despite the fact that he's doing this in the middle of a hallway in a high school that's got plenty of witnesses around. Oh, but then this is the part that really throws the self-defense uh, angle out the window. In a move that would make Jackie Chan look like a rank amateur, Arthur spins John around, gets him onto his stomach, lines his arm up, and then, a la curb stomping, stomps down on his, on his right arm and breaks it. Now, apparently, the damage was uh, not completely one-sided because Arthur got some cuts and bruises and uh, lost a tooth. It only took two strikes for me to defeat John while he had struck me around seven times. Yeah, the damage is so disproportional, though. Somehow, this does not get him arrested. That's because Arthur has the world's most impressive plot armor. He tries to explain to the cops that he was just losing his grip and the, the whole thing was self-defense and the cops being the dumbest cops in their entire department believed him. Now, Arthur does get suspended, but quite frankly, for this way over the top assault, deserved expulsion and arrest, but nothing bad really happens to Arthur. Nothing of significant consequence, and every time he should get in monumental trouble, it never happens. So pretty much the next chapter is all about Ashley and Arthur's relationship, because apparently what Arthur did to John just brought them closer. Question for the women in my audience, if you were dating a guy, you've been on like one date with him, hadn't even really made out with him, and you tell him that some guy in school just like grabbed your hips, not like touched anything, not breasts, not ass, nothing like that, just grab your hips, and your not quite yet boyfriend's response was to kick the crap out of this guy and break his arm, what would you think? Is that horrifying? Because it sounds horrifying. And the rest of the chapter is whining. This is so directionless. I, I've got to question why this exists. I am an alpha and will be till the day I die. People who have to announce that they are alphas or that they're in charge or anything like that are not alphas. You stay here. I'm in charge. Do you feel in charge? I know all this makes me sound like a terrible human being, and I no doubt am on multiple levels, but you only know a fraction of the story. Motherfucker, this is a first-person perspective story. You are telling everything from your perspective alone. Fill in some details, you sound like an ass. You could have twisted the story around so that you came off as an actual hero, but you didn't. You instead chose to go with this perverted sense of justice that you've been exuding ever since page one. Oh, and a uh, small note, just like Stones to Abigail, there's a teacher named Mr. Hansen in this book, so uh, Onision's really stretching the imagination with this, the, uh, the names here. And then there are, there are sections where Arthur gets stuck between frightened little child and incredible badass, sections like this. I experience an intense urge to walk around the table and stick a knife into the back of each of their thoughtless little heads. No doubt introducing a metal blade to the back of their brain would increase their IQs at least a few points. What? 
What does that mean? There's a section here where he's hanging out with Ashley at lunch, and they're hanging out with Ashley's friends, and I guess he doesn't like them? Because at one point he openly says, Ashley, can we ditch your loser idiot friends? There was no explanation as to why Ashley was even hanging around this people, aside from the likely possibility that she had a lot in common with them. It sounds like you answered your own question. But Arthur has no friends, as he points out, so I don't think he understands. Ashley, of course, being of sounder mind, despite dating Arthur, disagreed and just decided to sit around with her friends. So Arthur threw a hissy fit and left, uh, lifting his middle fingers at her while he continued to walk away. Ashley, for some reason, decided to try to salvage this relationship, and so she asked what she can do in order to prove herself to him, because all the women have got to prove themselves to the manly men who throw hissy fits like that. What the fuck? And so, Arthur tells her to dress up like a goth, and she does. This is supposed to be some big romantic gesture, but frankly, it's this manipulative, creepy... Ugh. And this leads to a very vigorous makeout session. Uh, more whining. More whining. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, this is the chapter where all of his daddy issues come out. So Arthur's dad and his girlfriend go up to visit Arthur's aunt, and they're dragging Arthur along with them. And apparently the petulant, spoiled brat that is our protagonist doesn't like this. My dad, being the horrible father he is, prioritized the wishes of his girlfriend over me. You horrid brat! Spend some time with your father while he's still around. Fuck. Now, he does try to give some last-minute justification as to why he doesn't like his father, but I'll save that for the end. It's really meaningless. But Arthur, being a petulant little brat, eventually gets the better of him. He's just ignoring his father, listening to music as loudly as possible, and eventually his father snaps, and he decides to choke a bitch. Is Wayne Brady gonna have to choke a bitch? Arthur's dad actually stops the car, gets out, and starts choking Arthur. Which, I mean, I can't fault. I would have done that several chapters ago if I had the option. But of course, Arthur wearing his big manly combat boots, because every stable teenager had those, and he starts kicking his father. For good measure, I followed that with anywhere from 9 to 17 kicks to his chest, neck, and head. 9 to 17 is an awfully broad gap. We get this really drawn out and awkward fight scene where the father is choking Arthur on one end of the back seat and the father's girlfriend is trying to uh, untie his shoes from the other end. Eventually Arthur does get away. When he finally does slow down, he gets arrested and taken to juvenile hall and thank God that finally expels him. Now, he did try to counter and say, oh, but my father attacked me, but no one cared about that. Because choke marks don't show up as well as boot marks to the face. Now, this is probably the only time where there's any kind of real consequence for something that happened to Arthur, but it's not meaningful because it's not really realistic. There is no investigation for anything that his father may have done, there's no investigation to see if he actually instigated the attack, it's just they instantly take the father's side of the story and completely discount that anything Arthur has to claim. Now, it's not very bad, yes, Arthur gets expelled, but he didn't care anyway. And besides, he gets his GED faster than the rest of the students get their diploma, so net gain, I guess, time saved? Now, if this were a comedy, or a satire, or something like that, then something like this could work. This, this unrealistic scenario would make sense. But this is much more an explanation about the darkness in Arthur's soul, by extension, Onision's. And the whole thing is this forced, built-up bullshit that could not really happen. It's the deranged ramblings of a narcissist who cannot connect or understand other people. 
He wants to be impressive, but he has no idea how to do it. So he just copies things that he sees from other sources, other TV shows and movies, things like that. Apparently not books, because a lot of people commented that Onision claims he doesn't read, which I would believe. This is basically what you'd get if Michael Scott was an edgelord. The worst thing about prison was the, was the Dementors. They were flying all over the place and they were scary and then they'd come down and they sucked the soul out of your body and it hurt. Arthur is an extremely lazy character because he takes no actions himself in order to better his life. He just expects everyone else to do the work for him, like when he forces his girlfriend to dress up like a goth. He makes no effort to reach out to other people, like his father, and takes no personal responsibility for when he screws up. It's his utter lack of awareness about himself that makes this so difficult to read. But I guess Arthur wanted to take some responsibility because this is where he decides to join the military. Now he starts off the chapter by discussing how he's having sex with his girlfriend because he's totally not a virgin. He's a big, awesome, manly man who has sex with his girlfriend on the regular and enjoys having sex with his girlfriend. This is very important. He has sex with his girlfriend. Did you get that? He also then signs up for the Air Force and breaks up the girlfriend that he's having sex with. It is so very important that you understand that Arthur uh, does in fact have sex. That's why he goes over it so bloody often. And this is a small point, but I just rather enjoyed this typo because his last meal at home uh, was something served by his father's frog-faced girlfriend, a phrase which happens very often in this book. The dish of curse was vegetarian. CURSE YOU VEGETARIANS! Anyway, so uh, military life starts in the book and there are some parts that Greg's real life Air Force experience actually does help flourish in this book. This is actually the start of the book, the, the section of the book that I thought was almost done well because just by reading it, he does have the technical knowledge to explain what the, the process of signing up for the military and going through uh, military entrance processing stations, uh, what that's all like, it, it sounds like he actually knows what he's talking about. He just doesn't explain it very well. It also doesn't help that he starts off by talking so very much about how the other guys in their entrance processing station were whining and crying Life for a lot of people seems to be about not appreciating what you have and always wanting more. And then there's also in the next paragraph, self-assigned victims will always be victims. You massive fucking hypocrite. Not an ounce of self-reflection in this character, anywhere in this book. He's always the victim, he's always the poor downtrodden guy. God, Onision's such a narcissist. Like not even the fun kind of narcissist where you just like looking at your reflection. You're, you're just like, the actual mental disorder kind. Although he does have a lot of technical knowledge of the military, he has no respect for it because Onision spends every moment that he can shitting on the military. Like when they get off the first bus and they're welcomed by a bunch of drill sergeants. Each bus was welcomed by the screams of sociopaths and people who were no doubt never hugged his children. Pot meat kettle. Now, I did a little bit of research on Onision before I made this video. Uh, I saw a live stream by a guy named Tommy C, um, video, I guess I'll link that in the description if I remember. While I will not discuss Onision's actual military career, they do, um, they're, they're actually Iraq vets, so they have much more expertise in that. I myself have never served, so I feel I have no right to comment on one service record or make jokes about it, so I won't. I'll just make fun of Arthur. While well, we are introduced to some of the initial training in the Air Force, I have to wonder how much of this is based on real events and how much Onision actually understood what was going on around him. There's a section where apparently all the trainees get summoned by uh, one of the sergeants, one of the drill sergeants, and they're told to uh, get on their back and raise all their limbs in the air so they look like dead cockroaches. And that's apparently a fun game they were just playing but according to one of the live streams that I just mentioned, that's a punishment. That's not the drill sergeants being sadists. Arthur apparently screwed something up. He also meets a woman named Corey Jeffries, and together they go through a suicide homicide prevention course. 
and because Arthur is so awesome, he and Corey are one of the only teams to actually pass it the first time. Apparently what they have is, there's a guy sitting on a bed in a simulation, and he's got a gun and he's threatening to kill himself. Well, everyone's having trouble talking him out of it, but Arthur, being the compassionate, empathic soul that he is, uh, is able to utter the words, you have so much to live for, this situation is temporary, you can be happy again, don't make this mistake. And that's all it takes. The guy puts down the gun and the chorus is one and... Jesus Christ, you have no idea what this is like. You just have these things being handed to him. He, he doesn't actually have to work for anything. Oh, but you think that was bad? So there's this next section, and I think this is actually based on a real event. Just the amount of detail that goes into this particular story, I think at, may have actually happened. Uh, not quite like this, but. So they're doing some training, and there's another sergeant who is trying to encourage him around, says, Ah, oh, you're a bunch of pansies. You should be ashamed of yourselves. The way you've been performing is pathetic. Usual drill sergeant shit. Well, Arthur decides that that's not right, so he speaks up and he says, Sergeant Cassava, you just violated the UCMJ. Now, he does eventually explain that acronym. It's the Uniform Code for Military Justice. It is uh, apparently pretty serious stuff. Arthur explains, the UCMJ specifically states that you are not authorized to use language that emasculates airmen. You called us pansies and have used other emasculating terms repeatedly throughout training. Full Metal Jacket would completely blow this kid's mind. This is my rifle, this is my gun, this is no fighting, this is no fun. Now, I actually talked to a buddy who was in the Air Force, and he said that, yeah, on paper, that is probably a violation. No one would give a shit, though. This kind of stuff, this kind of a complaint, is nothing compared to the shit that Gunny had the troops doing in Full Metal Jacket. God, I miss Lee Army. Arthur gets pulled into the Master Sergeant's office, who actually points to the correct section uh, in the UCMJ, and points out that Arthur is basically being a little shit. <laughs> And Arthur just stumbles away, humiliated. I believe this would happen because, from what I've seen of Onision, this seems to fit his M.O., like his style of arguing. Namely, he picks fights that no one asks him to start, fighting for people who don't ask him to fight, making himself look like an asshole all the way, and accomplishing nothing. So, basically, he's Dwight from The Office, but with none of the charm. So Arthur finishes basic and is sent out to be stationed in Oklahoma and Corey goes along with him, but it's not a romantic relationship. In fact, Arthur's not sure what kind of relationship it is. I'm not exactly sure what it is with her and I, but we haven't wound up in a typical guy-girl relationship, because men and women can't just be friends. Jesus Christ, Ash, you're gonna give yourself a concussion. Well, Corey seems to be the only person that Arthur can actually get along with. They apparently fall in love. There's some attempt at chemistry between the two of them. I can believe that humans at least say some of these words. Broken clocks are right twice a day. And Corey admits that she loves Arthur, somehow, and Arthur loves Corey, but there's not gonna be any kind of a physical relationship. We don't get an answer until most of the way through the rest of the book, but it turns out Corey is actually a lesbian and is in the closet. She doesn't explain this up front here, but Arthur just kind of accepts it and backs off, despite numerous explanations that he is male and therefore has needs. Like, it's not exactly rapey, but it comes off a little rapey. Oh, but that's not as important as, oh my god, have you heard what happened back home? THERE WAS A SCHOOL SHOOTING! Like, really, Onision? You don't even... The school shooting was pointless in the first book. This is so much dumber. I called it a footnote in the first book. No, this is a footnote! Arthur gets a panicked call from Ashley, and she explains that, oh my god, 
Thomas is dead. I don't know who Thomas is at this point. Thomas has not been introduced in any way. Um, we don't learn until the next page. It's a couple of pages later, actually. Uh, Thomas was actually Ashley's brother. So the school shooting only serves to get Arthur back home to hook up with Ashley. And they have trauma sex. Uh, it is the, uh, the healthiest, most normal form of sex ever. It, it seems like the only way Onision knows how to attract women physically is through some sort of intense emotional trauma. I'm sorry your brother died, you wanna bang it out? And I'm not saying that that's not a strategy, some people do that, it's fine. I'm pointing out that Onision just relies on that as a writing tool so often, it's weird, man. Do you pick up chicks at funerals? Our sorrow and our loved ones have a similar relationship to the one we have with beds in a way. We wouldn't throw ourselves upon cement when we were exhausted, but the moment we see a mattress, we free fall. The fuck does that mean? We just get a lot more detail about another sex scene. More pseudo-intellectual self-fellatio. Greg goes on for like three pages about the nature of love and romance and and tries to go into detail about where it exists in the brain. Is it evolutionary? Is it spiritual? What's going on with it? Names don't change the reality of what the name is attached to. You know, Shakespeare put it so much better when he said a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Onision's writing is just clumsy and awkward. Anyway, so that happened. Um, basically, the entire scene existed just so Arthur could get laid. So that was that was absolutely vital that you, that you know he got laid with a woman who was mourning the death of her brother who died in a school shooting. I told you it was a footnote. He could have died in a car accident and that would have been less tasteless. Well, uh, Arthur goes back to base, where he prepares to ship out to South Korea for uh, deployment. There's Corey, uh, who uh, is still in love with him, and even though they're not going to do anything about it. I, I just want to point out this particular moment of hypocrisy on Arthur's part. You see, Corey was apparently uh, going to lean in and give Arthur a kiss on the cheek goodbye, but... As she leaned in, I quickly turned my head at the perfect time so her lips would connect with mine. Isn't that sexual assault? You know, a lot of people got pissed off when Katy Perry did that on whatever that show was. The Voice, I think. Who cares? I don't watch it. And keep in mind, Arthur kicked the shit out of a guy and broke his arm for merely putting his hands on a girl's hips. Isn't this like a step further in terms of Creepville? Oh, I, I just remembered uh, the chapters all have titles here, and they're they're terrible. The chapter where he beats up John, crying at my feet. The chapter with the fight with Ashley, uh, rejected and aroused. The chapter where his father chokes a bitch. Blood means nothing. These are awful. So Arthur is deployed to South Korea, where he meets Lieutenant Colonel Haas. And the Lieutenant Colonel apparently wants them all to do push-ups, and Arthur has some very unique thoughts on those. Push-ups are basically our way of simulating slow, non-impactful punching. You know, they also have these things called punching bags. Those are for regular, actually impactful punching. Oh, yes, and then there is the red suit simulation. Basically, you've got a guy who's armored up in this red suit, and if you beat him, you don't have to do any of the rest of this 48-hour training mission. And of course, because he's the protagonist and has plot armor and is all sorts of badass, Arthur not only wins, he puts this guy in the hospital. And it's not just that he won the fight, he apparently had a baton for some reason, jammed it into his trainer's mask, then, before he could finish the sentence, I jumped up and kicked the baton deeper, driving it into his face. A loud pop rang out and Martinez began screaming. 
Oh, and despite breaking the trainer's nose and clearly winning the fight, Arthur decides to go full psychopath and beats the crap out of this guy way beyond what's reasonable. Once his foot was where I wanted it to be, I proceeded to stomping on his ankle with all of my weight till I heard a snapping sound. Our hero, ladies and gentlemen, is an emotionally stunted man-child who goes out of his way to kick the crap out of veterans fighting on behalf of their country. Good job, Arthur. Your country's proud of you. Dick. It also really doesn't help because you actually see Arthur activate badass mode because he gets punched 16 times before his nose begins to bleed. And then I mumbled to myself, all right, go ahead. It's like you can actually see him unlocking his super plot armor. This is the equivalent of watching a seven-year-old play pretend. This is just raw cringe. Arthur comes off as a desperate sadist. He has no outlet outside of violence and watching others suffer. He shows no remorse for his actions, nor any intention to change or improve himself. We are two-thirds of the way through this book, and the only thing Greg has managed to accomplish is he looks like a desperate tryhard. Hey guys, I beat up the mean army man. Am I cool yet? This is a small mistake for the writers to enjoy. For the remainder of this week, you will report to the base therapist office at 10 hundred hours ever day till they release you. First off, nice typo there. Second, why would you write 10 hundred hours with both numbers and letters? You do one or the other, you don't do both. It looks so gaudy. Now, those of you with some understanding of reality might think that Arthur would get in trouble for this over-the-top fiasco, breaking a senior airman's ankles for no reason. Uh, and you, of course, would be wrong. But uh, it's, it's justifiable, of course, because it doesn't look right on paperwork to reprimand a person for being too efficient of a fighter when they're in the military. I disagree. It actually makes perfect sense to reprimand a man with no self-control. My god, can anything stick to this guy? I'm too violent to be enlisted. Is that not what we're here for? Not if it means attacking the people on your side. Greg, of course, sees absolutely nothing wrong with his actions and just writes the whole thing up as being a faulty military logic. How is don't assault your peers and instructors faulty logic? So Arthur moves on for the little fiasco in the training room and he starts dating a woman named Rachel, better known as Booty. Apparently, if you saw her, you would understand why. Yeah, because that's that's a really respectful way to talk about your new girlfriend. Just refer to her by a particular body part. Uh, that's why my girlfriend loves it when I don't use her name. I just call her Nice Tits. So despite the fact that he is now widely regarded as kind of a psychopath, Booty doesn't really seem to mind this about Arthur. Uh, after all, as he defends, they want me to be the bone breaker I was born to be. You're in the Air Force. You're going to be piloting drones or maybe planes. Maybe. If you wanted to break bones, you could have been a ranger or a seal or something like that. When I think bone breaker, I don't think Air Force. Oh my god, and then there was this part. So, Arthur runs into this guy. His name is Austin. Austin's a bit of a douche. He's a douche because He's kind of objectifying Arthur's girlfriend. No, that's wrong, Austin. Only Arthur can objectify Arthur's girlfriend. And Austin apparently said, and keep in mind, all he's doing is just being crude and saying, hey baby, you wanna go hook up? That level of shit. Well, apparently saying, I'm definitely gonna bang your girlfriend is enough to cause Arthur to black out because he wakes up in the hospital in a neck brace with three broken fingers. Oh, and he's handcuffed to the bed because apparently what happened is he lost control and beat the shit out of Austin. Again, going way over the top. Our hero, everyone, beating up airmen because they looked at his girl funny. Your president salutes you, douche. For a moment, I was hopeful that something would actually happen, something bad would happen to Arthur as a result of his actions, but no. See, the Lieutenant Colonel walks in and starts screaming at some of the staff up front. I could hear someone screaming in the background, You're not going to take him anywhere! We want killers at this base! We want fighters! What's wrong with you? We're in the military, goddammit, not the goddamn Boy Scouts! I think someone needs to talk to the Lieutenant Colonel about the difference between 
fighters, like professional trained fighters, and delusional loose cannon lunatics. Because it's not just that Arthur beat this other guy up. Arthur blinded him in one eye. He gouged out one of Austin's eyeballs and lost a thumbnail inside of his head. It, it looked like he was actually gonna get punished for something, but of course not. He's gotta have this Lieutenant Colonel who apparently enjoys having psychopaths loose on his base. That is some really impressive plot armor there. Look, I know I'm wasting my breath when I try to point out ways that Onision can improve his writing style, but there's a certain degree of danger you want to put your characters into when you're writing. There's considered a range. You don't want them to be in too little danger because then the story's not very interesting and you're not worried about them. But you don't want them to be in too much danger because then the only way you can get them out of that is through plot armor, plot convenience, deus ex machinas, bad writing tropes, things like that. Onision is definitely up here. Arthur has screwed up big time, and the only way that he can get out of it is by a lieutenant colonel who doesn't understand his job very well or disciplinary records. I mean, this is a full-on section eight right here, but no, there's, there's no letter of reprimand, there's no article 15, um, other levels of discipline, nothing. Arthur gets off scot-free and he gets to go around actually as one of the members of the security force, basically cops on base. Lieutenant Colonel is a tremendous idiot if he cannot recognize that this airman has no self-control. You do not want someone like that in charge because he does not know what he's doing. There's some weak explanation for Arthur getting out of trouble because Booty claimed that Austin sexually assaulted her. There's a limit. Maybe get out of trouble, but you should still be discharged if you cannot be in control because you've just gone and ruined a man's career here yeah he's a dick but arthur you're not better this is like every dumbass monster movie where the military wants to use the giant monster as a weapon it takes incredibly bad writing to want to fuck up that badly but what happy coincidence occurs next but Corey actually shows up and is stationed to the same base as arthur she meets arthur and booty they uh, have some small talk and she talks about the guy with the eye patch she saw, who's apparently on duty now, I guess. And Arthur explains what he did to Austin. And Corey says that she doesn't have to really watch out with Arthur around. And Arthur says, no, you do. He's a bad guy. I know it. Pot, meat, kettle. Oh, and apparently Booty's a vegan. I'm not sure why that's important, but it is important to know. Literally thought I'd never bother with a vegan, but love obviously has nothing to do with diet. Thanks? Arthur then gets deployed to Afghanistan, and what happens out there? Nothing! We get a few pages of the description. He throws up into a hefty bag. It's a very pleasant image, thank you. But ultimately nothing happens. I He, he leaves for a little bit for no real reason. None of that had to happen. Oh, but you know what does happen? This typo. We landed the plane and I walked off. Well, it's better than landing a meadow. Those are a bitch. Oh, but there actually was kind of a reason, sort of not really, for Arthur to go away for however long it was he left. You see, while he was gone, Booty and Corey did a lot of talking together. And it turns out that they may be a little attracted to each other. Keep in mind that this is something that could have developed naturally while Arthur was still on the base, and there was no reason for him to actually leave. Hell, you could have just had him go off base for a weekend, and this whole scene would still make perfect sense. You could have had him leave for duty for the day and come back to this conversation, and it would still make sense. And I will give Anision credit, this actually did subvert my expectations because I thought this was going to lead to a threesome, and it doesn't. I mean, the book does joke about it, but it doesn't actually happen. I was so sure that these two very attractive women who find Arthur very attractive as well were going to both want to sleep with him suddenly because Arthur is just so attractive and of course is a stand-in for Onision. All the ladies love Onision for how bloody and murder happy he is. What woman would not want to date a guy who just breaks arms and ankles and gouges out eyeballs just because he gets a little irritated. But apparently, Booty and Corey talk about hooking up together, and it looks like 
Arthur's relationship with Booty might be over. I decided to just sand there. I don't like sand. But the whole thing turns out to be a red herring because actually, Booty wants to date both of them. Which, frankly, consenting adults, who cares? They can do what they want. Didn't Greg do something like this in real life with a woman he wanted to chain up in a basement? I don't know. Tell me about it in the comments section. So, after this healthy discussion, Arthur steps away to get some food while Corey and Booty both hook up in his room. Nice. Nice. And of course, while they're hooking up, he is fantasizing about it. I can't say it enough. My mind is routinely invaded by perverted thoughts. The millions of potential human beings I carry between my legs every day inspire this line of thinking. No one talks like you. Arthur then goes into excruciating detail about how that's okay, about how his urges are totally tolerable. I, I just I put a big X on this page just because it's the same garbage over and over. Existential bullshit comparing humans to animals, but it's okay because we're on a different level or something. Oh my god, this is such terrible writing. Oh, and there's also shitting on people who uh, don't like people because they're gay, which, fine, I, I'm not gonna argue against that, but why do you gotta bring animals into it? At one point he says, comparing us to the other animals is like putting a bicycle next to a spacecraft and claiming it's the same thing. Where are you going with this? I get that Onision is accidentally imitating a stream of consciousness writing style, but even then, this is directionless. Anyway, so these three kind of take turns just having sex. Uh, apparently this was back during the don't ask, don't tell policy though, which means that perceived homosexuality was uh, heavily frowned upon. Now, I don't actually know that much about how homosexuals were treated in the military back during those days, so I don't know if the simple perception of being gay was enough to get you kicked out, but apparently that's what's going on here. And at one point, Corey and Rachel were holding hands in a hallway, and apparently this little Weasley guy named Asher, a friend of Austin's, the guy who got his eye gouged out. Apparently he saw it, told Austin, and Austin planned to use the information to his advantage. But of course the story is so sloppily told that we're not actually told what that threat might be. That means Airman Austin's threat was very real and very harmful. We haven't seen any kind of a threat yet. Nothing was said, nothing was exchanged. We don't know what's going on. Everything's being told out of order, it's bizarre. Uh, we then get a metric ton of typos until we eventually reach this rather telling line where Arthur decides that he's going to do whatever he needs to to keep Corey on base. Through violence or bargaining, Corey is mine to keep close. No one would separate is again. Nice typo, but when you start to make Christian Grey and Edward Cullen look stable, seek help immediately. Arthur, of course, being the psychopath that he is, can only think to respond to this potential threat through violence. So he breaks into Asher's room, scares off Asher's roommate, and then threatens Asher with a knife. He laughed clearly not even caring his neck movement was causing the tip of my knife to draw small amounts of his blood. As my knee pressed down on him, frustrated by his sociopathic response, Greg, do you hear yourself think? Anyway, Austin eventually comes to the rescue and pulls Arthur off of Asher. Arthur is not arrested on the spot for threatening to murder another airman. Keep in mind, he's got a well-documented history of violence at this point, and they're not doing anything with that. They could very easily kick him out. Austin could get his revenge and get Arthur dishonorably discharged for attacking a peer. But no, no, it's, it's that runs the risk of Arthur having to deal with his his actions and the consequences thereof. This is so stupid. The defense for that is apparently Austin knows the lieutenant colonel is on Arthur's side and doesn't think that reporting will do any good. Again, documentation. There is a known history of over-the-top violence from this guy. After a while, this will go over the lieutenant colonel's head and he won't be able to protect him. But it's not like none of the blame goes to Arthur as well. After all, all I'd have to do is tell him about them harassing my loved ones 
and he, the lieutenant colonel, would sign off on almost any response I chose to take. Then why didn't you do that? Why isn't your first response, go to the lieutenant colonel, the guy you know likes you, and try to file some sort of paperwork or grievance or complaint or something? Why is your first instinct, go attack guy with a knife? And you claim you're not a psychopath, God. And he's sure that the lieutenant colonel would take his side because people like us hate people like Austin and his crew. The more they suffer, the safer we feel. You are deluded. Arthur actually has a mental disorder. That is the only explanation I will accept. Ugh, okay. This is the part where it gets uh, good and difficult. So, um, keep in mind, Austin's carried through his threat. Corey's about to be discharged for uh, being a lesbian. All Austin and his crew has to do is stand down and Arthur's little love triangle gets ruined, they lose their Cory, and they all have a bad time because of it. But apparently that's not good enough because Austin and his crew decide to spring a trap. Arthur, Cory, and Booty are walking out of a restaurant when they get distracted by some guy asking for help. So apparently he's part of Austin's crew. Arthur decides to stop and help the guy real quick, or at least find out what he wants. And before I get into the subject of what this part of the chapter does wrong, I'm just going to say the book does a very obvious, very bizarre turn with no real warning. See, it starts going away from Arthur's first first person perspective and starts following uh, the, the women as they're going through the hallways. And it's like, Arthur's not around to witness any of this. What's going on? How does he know this? How is, how is he recreating dialogue that he wasn't present for? And the book does explain itself later on. I'll get to that in a bit. But it's such a sudden shift and it's so out of place that you can't help but think of it as this obvious writing mistake, especially considering everything else we've seen thus far. But that's not the bad part. I'm, I'm not gonna read from any of this. It's, um, it's awful. Austin and his crew were waiting in Booty and Corey's room and attacked them, knocked out Corey, and we get a short description of Booty's clothes being torn off while Austin and the others prepare to rape her. And this is so incredibly tasteless. The best way I can actually sum this up, uh, comes from a, a comment left on my Stones to Abigail review. This one says, as a rape survivor, I am super tired of rape as a plot device. It is usually written with more focus on how the men or other people in the survivor's life are affected versus the coping and emotional trauma the survivor has to deal with. First off to the person who wrote that, I hope you're doing okay. Sorry, I'm getting a little angry right now. But that is actually a very good point, because within this plot, within within the other book, of course, but more so in this one, Booty is being very violently assaulted. But the focus shifts away from that. We're given a taste of her assault in an attempt to stir our emotions as readers. Again, if you can use anything other than rape, don't use rape. But this scene is not about Booty or Rachel, as her name actually is, getting assaulted. This is about Arthur, as a stand-in for Onision, coming in and getting horrible, violent revenge for them. And you've got Corey bleeding from the head on one side. You've got Rachel being held down on the bed. At that point, none of their impressions or thoughts are as important as the thoughts going through Arthur's head. 
Because at that point, he starts killing all the rapists. And I'm not going to shed a tear for those guys. They're, they're scumbags. But to try to wrap this up with some justifiable homicide to get revenge at Austin, when frankly none of this had to happen, Austin was written to be in this position when it makes no sense. He wanted to get some degree of power, as the book tries to explain, but he already won. He made his move, he carried out his threat, and because of that, Corey's getting discharged for being a lesbian. That's a whole thing I'm not going to go into, but what's this, what, what purpose does this realistically serve? There was, this is being done in the dormitories with the girls screaming, of course, so of course someone's going to get notified. This is all so very badly set up, but the only reason this scene is in here is for Arthur to look like a badass and a hero in his mind. The effect it has on Corey and Rachel means nothing. It is not nearly as important as you recognizing that Austin and his gang are bad people and feeling some sense of joy at them getting killed. One gets um, his throat cut in and slashed out, much like we see, uh, we've, we've seen Jihad John do that. He's literally sawing necks off of people. Good unintentional comparison there, Onision. Asher gets strangled, no, no. Asher gets his head bashed against a radiator uh, to death. And Austin gets stabbed in the eye, apparently into his brain. And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be jumping around here a little bit, but um, in the next chapter we see that Corey and Rachel are are perfectly okay, which is good, I guess. But at the same time, there's no impact for them, as this extremely traumatizing assault should have. And they're happy. They, there's like no apparent trauma left over from the attack. Uh, they're happily living together. On an emotional level, this has the same impact on the two of them that getting shouted at on a bus would have. Keep in mind, Rachel has been stripped almost completely naked when this is going on. And there are threats that Austin and his gang are going to do the same thing to Corey. So, while I don't particularly care that these scumbags are getting killed, I'm frankly so off-put by the misuse of this as subject matter that I am not in the moment the way Onision intended. I am not pissed off at the rapists for their attack. I am pissed off at Onision for thinking that he could pull this off and for just using rape to fill his own fantasies about himself. That's not cool. That's one of the lamest fucking things I think you can do as a writer. You're a piece of shit, Greg. Grow up. Anyway, so Greg, I'm sorry, Arthur, manages to stab Austin in the eye during the fight with a big-ass knife. He doesn't mention what kind. I'm assuming it's a K-bar, but I could be wrong. He says, it felt like my knife went right through his entire brain to the back of his head. The problem is, apparently it didn't, because Austin got up and um, managed to take a hatchet that he was using to threaten Rachel with and bashed Arthur in the head and actually killed him. The main character of this story dies, which I'm cool with. It's like, good riddance. I didn't like him anyway. We're supposed to feel some degree of remorse and sorrow for this loss of this guy who was just trying to defend two women, but um, see previous rant. The last chapter is Corey trying to fill in the blanks and uh, you know what? I'm in too bad of a mood. I'm gonna go over some typos real quick just to just to get myself into a better mood. Cause that 
pissed me right the fuck off. So it wasn't just enough that Arthur had to kill Asher, he had to kill him creatively using his bare hands. Come on, motherfucker, what you got? I got bare hands here. Oh wait, better not forget the Second Amendment. Now I can bear arms too! Oh, but continuing on with Asher, apparently Arthur really had to make sure that he killed the guy. I continued bashing his head into the vent till I could be absolutely sure he was completely and irreversibly dead. As opposed to reversibly dead, cause you know, goddamn those zombies. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. So we get the last chapter, it's just Corey summing everything up. Uh, Austin got thrown into jail and Arthur was buried with honors in a military cemetery. The thing that stuck out to me though was the comment about Arthur's father. And this is what I call backtracking instead of editing because this is thrown in at the last minute as if Greg wanted to include this little plot point but didn't want to include it earlier because that would require him to go back and rewrite something. Which, by the way, all good books are rewritten at some point. I mean, this thing isn't even reaching basic fan fiction levels of quality. But it turns out that Arthur's father was abusive. Apparently when he was a child, Arthur's father would sneak into his bedroom and molest him. And that's incredibly distasteful, but here's where I'm confused. Apparently Arthur didn't remember that until he started attending some therapy lessons, but those therapy lessons didn't occur until after he was in the military. So why was Arthur like that against his father? Why did he so vehemently hate his dad? I mean, if you don't remember it, that could just be teenage angst, but at the same time, why would you feel the need to include that if it's not central to the character? This is a last minute justification for Arthur's hatred. Maybe Onision didn't think that he had done enough to really justify the dad being this douchebag. Oh, maybe him being religious wasn't enough. So you gotta include him being a rapist as well. Oh, and there's also this little uh, point. Apparently Austin was able to survive because the blades scraped the side of his skull till it pierced completely through the side of Austin's skull. Which, oh, that is a sentence. I'm not sure how that works because the blade did go through his eye. I'm just fascinated by the sentence because of how wrong it is. It's repetition because he uses the word skull twice in one sentence. It uses the wrong spelling of till and Oh, yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure it's medically impossible. This is just top-notch garbage. This was all around uh, the new crowning champ of worst book I have ever read. James was an obnoxious protagonist, but Arthur does not have a single redeemable quality about him. I can't list a single thing I liked about him. The, the closest I can come is... His character was consistent, but it was consistently an asshole, so what am I going to do with that? This book is so badly written that I can actually open to any random page and read any random line, and it'll be cringeworthy. Certainly helps that I have a tab on almost every single page in this book. Some, I got a whole bunch. Here, this is one single page has... Seven notes. Uh, I forgot to <laughs> go over the many descriptions that Arthur has for his dad's girlfriend. On one single page, he describes his dad's girlfriend as a sack of potatoes, Jabba the Hutt, a genital puppet, a double chinned idiot, a princess wannabe troglodyte, and a one out of ten paper bag girlfriend. Now keep in mind, we haven't seen the girlfriend do anything I think the most interaction she does for Arthur is she makes him dinner and she tried to take off his shoes during the fight scene, but that's not a bad thing. Arthur is this incredible brat to her and the poor woman's done nothing. I don't think she actually has any dialogue in this book. Once again, this entire book sounds like Onision just recreating his past. 
Uh, he keeps calling everyone else humans or drones, like he's trying to raise himself above everyone else, regardless if he actually earned it or not. Now, he calls himself an alpha at one point, but real leaders and real alphas, as he calls himself, take a step down in order to help everyone else around them. Real leaders and real alphas bring everyone up, not just themselves. Like his last book, this is just another reason for Onision to jump on a soapbox and yell at people. The problem is everything here he says is not very interesting or he's flat out wrong, and the character giving these messages has proven himself to be a complete asshole. No one would want to listen to someone like that, and yet Onision tries. The good news is Onision didn't use the school shooting to push another clumsily assembled anti-gun rant. The bad news is he did use it so that Arthur could have sex with his ex, also to push some sophomoric existential garbage. In regards to Arthur ripping out Austin's eye, First, Onision is trying too hard to be badass. Second, Arthur would be discharged immediately whether or not the assault was justifiable. Third, he just permanently blinded another airman, assaulting yet another veteran. Even if he was able to get off any disciplinary charges thanks to Rachel lying, how are we as readers supposed to like Arthur? He just ended a veteran's military career over a snide comment. Arthur is just far too hot-headed and retaliatory. And that's pretty much it. I've been doing this for far too long. <sighs> that is the worst book I have ever read. And I hope it stays like that because I've got one more to go through. I'm not looking forward to Reaper's Creek. You guys will have to forgive me for taking a small break on that one, but I'm uh, hesitant to get into Onision's third book because I've already checked the ratings on Goodreads. That one's so bad, the army of fans that he sent to upvote it in mass still didn't do a lot to protect it. <sighs> Pray for me.